Welcome to the Elliot Hulse Podcast. Podcast. I am the king of making men strong. Shedding of the old man, right? The way we can freely walk into rising, ascending, cleansing, sanctifying our soul for it's the Yo Elliot God. Show. I like that. If you're a high achieving businessman, executive, or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating, or any filthy vice, here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency in 90 days or less, not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com fill out an application and my team will get back to you with the details. Hope to see you on the inside. Done. Yo bros, it's your bro Elliot Hulse here back with the another podcast, Yo Elliot Show, the Elliot Hulse podcast. And today I have my first live guest in many, many, many weeks. We've been doing a lot of virtual stuff. Um, But this guest was a student in my King Transformation program. And then last year I did an experimental case study group with a group of men who were looking to find a wife. A little different than what you find in the world today in terms of trying to get laid or trying to find a girlfriend. It was a matter of finding that girl that's going to be your girl for life. Because if you know, I love having a wife. I love marriage and family. And I truly believe that the return of family and patriarchy is going to be the way for our future. And so Gabriel Butu is our guest. Lovely to be here, Elliot. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, Good thank you. to be you. here uh, in the footsteps of the Orlando Magic. Uh, I used to collect those NBA base, uh, basketball cards as a kid, and I just noticed we're here right by the Amway Center. I had, yep. I had Penny Hardaway, I had Shaquille O'Neal. Uh, it's just funny here, passing it by on the way to this studio. That's right. We're in downtown Orlando. You're a Floridian also now. I am now. Straight up Florida, man. Mm-hmm. Uh, moved here about a year ago, as you know. From, right. from the West Coast. So I uh, settled in nicely. And it's good to be here. Yeah, I mean, I was driving across from Tampa Bay on my way here to Orlando. And I was thinking it's so funny because your gym in St. Pete, which is right by Tampa, was like a not insignificant reason I moved to Florida. When I was deciding to leave LA, I was scouting out Miami, Naples, and Tampa because I had charities that I work with in each of those. And when I was doing recon in Tampa, which I was a bit like, you know, Tampa, uh, but I ended up getting an Airbnb in St. Pete, which is just across the bridge. It's kind of a twin city situation. And it was right around the corner from Strength Camp. And so I was dropping into Strength Camp and I was never a big gym goer. Like I would stay fit and whatever. But this was just like flipping tires, carrying kegs, right? So fun. And I could see myself and I was like, you know what? I do want to up my, my uh, fitness game. St. Pete could be a good spot to do that. And I joined Strength Camp and I was just there yesterday. Still That's- going strong. Amazing. Although it's overtime athletes now. I think you, That's right. you sold up recently. Or, mm-hmm. yeah. yeah, to my partner, Chris, and yeah. he's running it. I didn't realize that you were still training there. You went and did a workout yesterday. Yes, sir. That's pretty cool. We've done a lot of things together. Yeah. Uh, we've crossed paths in many regards, uh, one of which is marriage and family. And so you joined my program last year uh, about how to court a woman and make her your wife. And so, you know, I wasn't sure how it was going to do, but we got 24 guys who were interested in walking this path of righteous dating, doing it from a Christian perspective uh, where chastity was considered and vetting a wife, not just based on her looks or how fun she is uh, when you're getting hammered together, um, but wife worthiness. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, and it's been pretty amazing watching you and the other guys in the program navigate uh, the dating landscape 
with a sense of virtue in all of your dealings with women. Uh, tell us a little bit about what attracted you to the idea of going from, well, you're a good looking guy, you're charismatic, uh, you had a, a, a dating history of you know revolving door with women, very good in that regard, but then having a change of heart and realizing that maybe this isn't the way for me and I want to go about it in a more virtuous way and be a family man at some point. Yeah, totally. I mean, you know, I, I, uh, I come from a broken home. So in a sense, you know, when you do that, you're, you've always got a bit of a knot in your heart and you, you're a bit of a romantic misfit. You, you have to address that. And I never did. So I spent my teens, 20s, you know, just living that fast life in big cities, London, New York, L.A. And in line with that, you know, fast women and a fast approach to that and a very transactional approach to that. And you're like, well, what's wrong with that? You know, that's just that's actually promoted. Right. And uh, and and I was completely ignorant, blissful in the ignorance for a while. And then, you know, as I approached, you know, 30s and starting to sort of sense that maybe this wasn't right and starting to realize maybe that uh, I'd been taken for a bit of a ride by this ideal of being this kind of Don Juan and so forth. And through various different paths eventuated in your program, you know, I mean, it, it was providential, you know, when I moved to Florida, I felt like I wasn't just moving to Florida, I was moving away from LA. I had to get out of that lion's den because it is, it is the mainstream culture, you know, you just need to watch the sitcoms of the 90s and 2000s and this idea of one night stands and this, this very kind of throwaway approach to relationships. And, and, and so I, I wanted to unlearn that and relearn something that I'd never even learned in the first place because I never had a family to model. You know, my parents split when I was six. And so I always had as role models broken homes, you know, all through my family, both of my grandparents were basically broken homes. My parents are a broken home. So you have nothing to hang your thinking on. So your program really helped me sort of create a framework basically and understand what a healthy approach to finding a relationship and, and maintaining a relationship was. It's quite a sacrifice. You know, a lot of guys uh, may be watching this and like they genuinely just want to get laid. They're, they want to be a part of the dating culture. They're seeking out promiscuity. For you who it came kind of easy for, um, to give that up, there must have been something that seemed better. What was so attractive about the alternative to hookup culture that made you say, okay, you know what, I'm done. I'm going to choose chastity. I'm going to be remain uh, celibate until I find a woman that I'm going to make my wife. When I started waking up to this was in my, in around 2019, let's say, when I started to get a bit more into spirituality. I, I took a trip to India. I visited an ashram in the Himalayas and I stayed there and I got to grips, not so much actually with Hindu mysticism, but some other stuff peripheral. And one of the things I realized was I was a perpetual pleasure seeker. I was just in my career, in my relationships, in my lifestyle, I was looking for pleasure. And why? And why, you know, I, I actually had quite a lot of success, you know, by my 30th year financially and so forth. And I remember my 30th birthday being like, well, you know, I'm at the height, highest heights of the high life here on the western precipice of civilization in you know beverly hills california why do i feel like i'm at my lowest low what's going on here and we've heard this all before i mean it's almost cliche now so my per my personal search you know was a realization that uh, there was this like capax day this hole in my heart left by god and i think that's what i started to resort to is like okay well what is that and so i went down a couple different avenues um and didn't really find much and then it found me. And one of the ways that I quickly realized that I needed to change was, was that. Not only because of what it was, the damage it was doing to me, but also the damage it was doing to other people who I was indulging in these sort of flings with or whatever it might be. You know, we're both on the same page, but are we really, you know, are we really uh, growing out of this? You know, it, 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 so there was one final stand I had where I, you know, had one of these situationships, as they're called now. Yeah. And I just looked at it and I just thought, 
this can't go on. And I didn't see any off ramp to that. And then my off ramp to that was this Exodus 90 program, uh, which I know you did. Yeah, that's and right. I, you did it with our group last year, correct? I actually didn't end up doing it with your group, but you were the one who alerted it to me, right? But then I actually found a group locally to me. And that was what was incredible about moving to. So I moved to St. Pete, Tampa Bay in October 2021. And then I hear about Exodus 90 in December 2021. And then I joined Exodus 90 starting in January 2022. And that really was, you know, the, um, the big, the big sort of watershed moment for me. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things I like to say, which is affirmed in Theology of the Body that we were talking about in my guest last week, uh, one of the things I like to say is there are two righteous paths for a man. There's marriage and there's monk. Both require discipline in different ways. And as you're exploring women for the potential of marriage, you're essentially in monk mode, right? You're, especially if you're not watching pornography and masturbating, things of that nature. Um, how do you discipline yourself? Or, or in other words, how do you con have self-control, especially in a world where sexual indulgence is uh, highly looked upon and you know, promoted? Initially, it's, it's full get up again, full get up again, right? I mean, uh, Way of the Ascetics, I think it's a book you recommended. It's an orthodox book. Uh, and they talk about what's a monk's life like? Well, it's fall and get up again. And so in the initial stages, you have to kind of make that intention, you know, that you're going to um, just cut things off that you normally took sort of just with a pinch of salt. And then though, you have to fill that with something, right? Mm. And because we're human beings, we still have eros, we still have sensual requirements. And I think um, St. John of the Cross is excellent for this, you know, the dark night, the dark night of the uh, senses, and then the dark night of the spirit, right? Those two compiled equal the dark night of the soul. And I think people forget that there's a dark night of the senses there, right? Which is yeah. basically like, when you're retraining your whole value system, your whole pleasure reward system into something that's, I, I think at the end of the day, much healthier. And so that is essentially what the Christian blueprint is, right? It's how do you take away loving the world and all that's in it and find a way to love Christ and sort of then be in the world, but not of it. And that's the brilliance of the algorithm in a way is that it, through the saints and so forth, you learn this. You unlearn all your bad habits and it's time and patience, but it's just a sort of a also intellectual realization that relationships aren't transactional. And today in tech, in sort of the world that we live in, things have become very transactional. So technology connects us more than ever. It's wonderful. There's so many fantastic things about it, but it also disconnects us more than ever. And so I see this in the charity world, which is where I work, you know? Um, the increasing sort of mechanization and transactionalization of it. And what I'm trying to do in every part of my life is, uh, is humanize it more, right? So how can we make both parties to this feel like they're actually engaging with a human being and, and not just a, a robot? So you're still dating. You're, I mean, you're essentially looking for a woman. How does one go about remaining virtuous uh, in a world where the expectation is the fast road to hopping in bed? How do you deal with women that who may, you know, not understand or look poorly upon you as a result? How do you handle that? You know, it's funny because when I started dating this way, <laughs> some, some of the shock that I would get from someone that I was on a date with, you know, maybe we'd date once, twice. And then it's like, let's order an Uber and get back to your place. That's kind of the, the, the expectation. And I'm like, I'm not, I'm not down for that. And I would usually get a look of disbelief. Like actually I'd get a, a kind of a scoff or like a laugh, like, yeah. <laughs> like that I was, I was being You're ironic. Turning because me totally, down. Yeah, yeah. Because it seems like a completely right. ironic statement, right? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just being sarcastic. Like, yeah, sure. No, I'm afraid I'm not like that. But I was like, no, I'm serious. I'm, you know, this is, this is, uh, this is just my game plan. How do you explain that to her without, without her feeling yeah. uh, offended or rejected? Because I could imagine a woman in that way would feel like there's maybe there's something wrong with her. 
It's a really good point. I mean, it comes back to the idea of charity and empathy and sort of being like, yeah, obviously this is, you know, just clarifying it with her. Like, this is nothing to do with you personally. This is, this is my MO. And, but providing the context of that, like, yeah, I haven't always been this way, but this is what I think is gonna be the way that works for me because maybe I'm not your average guy. So I need to maybe overcompensate, although I don't think it's overcompensating, but you know, I gotta be, I gotta be kind of strict with this. And so, you know, and again, you know, I've towed the line. I haven't been like an absolute monk, but I've definitely stayed on this side of the line and increasingly so. Like it's, it's gotten easier to do that as I've progressed on this journey. And what reason do you give a woman? And do you find that most of them are receptive or most of them just check out at that point? No, they, I mean, I had one. So I went on a date in New York City and, you know, I was a little naughty. I went back to her place. She lived in this huge penthouse in Midtown, incredible views over the skyline. But we just, you know, we stayed up, we chatted, whatever, like nothing too much happened. And, but then later on, you know, she actually gave me a call the next week and was like, yo, I just need to check that I heard you right. And that evening actually happened. Did you really? And I was like, yeah, no, no, I really, that's, that's where I'm at. And then we had a long kind of deep meaningful where I explained to her and she was actually uh, a Catholic, but sort of just completely lapsed like I used to be. And I kind of tried to contextualize it in that way. But again, it's, it's, if you'd told me this two, three years ago, I'd have been like, sort of square you. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. counterculture. Yeah. I have a sense that it's going to make its way back in some way, shape or form. I think you're kind of on the cutting edge in that regard, because marriage and family is the foundation of our society. It's a building block of humanity. And in fact, according to uh, Theology of the Body, the coming together of a man and woman uh, is likened unto Christ and the church and Mary. And so it's a spiritual, mystical union between man and woman. Um, do you struggle? Which I'm sure you do. You know, there's a lot of suffering associated with the path that you've chosen. But do you struggle considering that, you know, perhaps I'm out looking for a wife, but this woman has been living a promiscuous lifestyle. Uh, I'm walking the virtuous path. How do I, how do you reconcile that knowing that like, you know, well, um, she might not be having sex with me, but she may be looking for or continuing to having sex with someone else. Do you check out at that point or? You know, I haven't really encountered that, you know, because I think that I've been sort of looking in certain areas where I, I, I know that is exactly the you know, what I used to go for. So I know what that looks like usually. Oh, got it. That was my go-to type so of woman. So you're avoiding those type of women. You know, so I, I can kind of sense a little bit that now of when I may be encountering where to avoid that sort of thing, because that's temptation to me as well. You know, I need to be careful about that. So I'm quite discerning in terms of who I even would go on a date with. Where do you uh, seek out virtuous women that would be receptive to this way? Well, I did your program. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay, so there's basically three ways to go about this, right? I mean, you go the dating app route, you got your social circle route, friends, family, work, and then you got serendipity, you know? Right. And I was very much initially very dating apps, and then I quit those because I found that it's so dehumanizing in a way. I, I know wonderful couples and marriages and families that have come out of dating apps. Um, but if you're, it's a little bit like an alcoholic and a drink, you know, some people just shouldn't be in a bar. You know what I mean? And so that, that was a little bit like me. Mm. So I, I kind of precluded that at some point. So that left social circle and serendipity. And that was partly why I joined your program because I don't have a very big social circle. I live in a foreign country. You know, I've just moved to a new city. So where, what is my social circle? And it's pretty, pretty limited. And so I'm also self-employed. I work from home, I'm a freelancer. So I don't have that built-in uh, social network that you get from working in an office, which is fantastic in a way. So serendipity, okay, what's serendipity? But actually, and that was partly, you know, what I learned through your program, that you can sort of um, stack the deck serendipitously. You can sort of organize the serendipity a bit, hedge your bets <laughs> by being proactive about it and figuring out, okay, there's such, there's such things as online serendipity, right? I mean, serendipity doesn't literally have to be like a meat cute where you spill coffee on someone in a bookshop, you know? Um, and that's what 
Benny from your program was really good at sort of uh, helping us with is like, okay, how do you not use dating apps to meet someone online, for example, in a, in a more organic way? So uh, Benny was a coach that I brought in to coach the guys in my program. And um, he's a dating coach. He teaches guys. I had him on the podcast not too long ago. You guys can go look at that video. Um, he teaches a method by which you use social media to seek out and vet women. What was that process like for you? I know you've met a couple of girls. I know that you're, you're currently dating, if I, I can say that. I already said it. Um, but what are some of the things, first of all, um, that you do to filter out those that may not be uh, wife worthy? And what are some of the cues you're looking for in the women that may be worth your time? Yeah, so I'll be honest, I was pretty skeptical about this method at first because it just seemed a little almost, I don't know, mechanical, crass. But essentially, you know, he advocates primarily through Facebook, which is how he met his wife. And I mm -hmm. think he bases this on, right? Facebook for us millennials seems a little bit, you know, old school now, right? right. You know, Instagram sliding in the DMs has become a cultural motif, but Facebook was his go-to because he said, you know, on Facebook, actually, you can, you can meet people that are sort of friends of friends. So you can almost emulate that social circle aspect. And, but then the nifty thing, which he discovered is that the Facebook algorithm has this suggested friends feature where it feeds you recommended friends based on whatever is going on under that hood. And he said, that is the key because he said, if you start adding friends of friends in your city that basically you know the friends that they're friends with when it says, you know, you have X friends in common are sort of your type of people. So you know that your values are probably roughly overlapped at least. The algorithm will then see that that's the type of person you're adding and start feeding you more people like that, which is a little scary. You know, it's like Mark Zuckerberg looking over your shoulder, but that's exactly what happened. I mean, suddenly you start within a few days of this process, you start getting suggested friends and it's like they're almost curated for you. And that's how I met the, 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 the lady I'm currently seeing, yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I have to bring Benny on again to, to sort of divulge that process. Uh -huh. But what was it like for you? Were you, um, were you looking for certain keywords? Were you looking for certain types of behavior or, um, or characteristics in their profiles? How did you know who was worth approaching? you quickly realize, so what Benny says is, right, you, you guys add each other as a friend, and then the first thing you do is send her a video message, which again, way out of your comfort zone. I was so awkward about it for the first few, and I think all of us in the men's group was, right? And, um, but what that does is, okay, 70% of the women are gonna be weirded out or whatever, maybe, who, who knows, they're just gonna be like, he's not my type, I don't like him. But what it does is, it, again, shows her your personality, shows her what you look like, sound like, and vibe like, so then she can immediately decide, okay, is this a guy that I would want to at least go on a date with? And so um, that then, she, she will then get back in touch with you and then you sort of set up a time to talk on the phone. And the phone call is really where you can establish, you know, personality and values, immediate sense of virtues and so forth, right? So previously the dating protocol was, is she hot, is she fun? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then like, a distant third was like, oh, you know, is she virtuous? And now it's kind of leading with, okay, is she virtuous? And, you know, do we at least have some vibe? Okay, let's, let's get to know each other better. And, and virtuous, you know, comes back to what you would always say, is she a Proverbs 31 woman? Right. You know, and, and all the sort of <laughs> bullet points on that list of, and again, that was like installing a whole new app in my mind of, okay, um, what would a good partner in crime be for the rest of my life? And being a high risk marriage candidate myself, right? If you're from a broken home, you are way more likely to become a broken home member yourself. You, you know, that, I guess I'm a little extra cautious in terms of how I go about this and make sure that I have someone who's not just here for a good time, but for a long time. How do you make your intentions known uh, without scaring her away? I mean, I think it's, for the most part, people are thinking like, we're talking, how quickly can we have sex? Where you're thinking, are you worth being my partner for life? Are you worth being a wife? Um, I'm sure it could scare some women away if you're too upfront with that. When and where do you make your intentions clear that I'm not just looking for a good time, I'm looking for a long time? 
I'm pretty, again, your program was last summer. So what are we, nine months from? Mm -hmm. And like literally in the last week of your program, I met the person I'm dating now. So initially, the way we got to know each other really well was WhatsApp audio messages. That was just the quirk of our initial getting to know stage. I mean, we went to a first date at the Strauss Center in Tampa to a play. (laughs) And she had just got back from somewhere anyway it was like it was a bit random but uh you know and then it was very clear like immediately that she was like pretty clearly catholic you know she's from latin america she is very catholic um and that's central part of her life and she wasn't always that way she kind of came back to it and so that was immediately like a topic of conversation because also the friends that we had in common around Tampa Bay all seemed to fall into that category. So then there's a lot of shorthand that you get, you just gloss over then almost because you're like, okay, well, boom, that's built in right. to the Catholic faith. If it, you know, It's hard to go to daily mass and then be off philandering at night. <laughs> it's just not really, and especially she had a little bit of a sort of experience with that. And so we could relate on that level. And uh, that was a topic that, you know, and it still is a topic of like how to navigate that side of things. But, you know, it's just upfront, straightforward communication. You got to be you got to be ready, ready to do that, because otherwise you guys, you know, if you can't communicate with ease on that level, uh, that, that might be a little bit of a red flag there. Yeah. And so, you know, throughout the course, we spoke about courtship. We followed Father Ripperger's advice on courtship. And it's a, it's a process by which we get to know each other and whether or not um, we're compatible for marriage. Um, a lot of people might be asking like, okay, I understand dating. And for the most part, if we're going to get together, we're probably going to fall into sin. They're not thinking that. But it's like, how quickly can we snuggle and get very physically affectionate? Um how do you get to know someone without that physical affection and that, you know, that sexual interplay? A lot of guys are confused. They're like, and, and you know, women and men both are confused. Like, well, how do I know if I were compatible if we're not having sex? Yeah. I mean, there's this thing I learned about recently called the intimacy ladder, you know, and it's basically the idea that, well, you slowly work your way up to that, la- up that ladder to eventually physical intimacy. In our culture, and certainly in my past life, as it were, that ladder was upside down, right? Right. You go straight for the physical intimacy. And I almost feel like that is a way of avoiding the real intimacy. Right. If you just get naked and get, get it on immediately, okay, you are in an in, enormously intimate in, uh, situation, but you know, and then what? You guys have just jumped all the way to the finish line and do you even know each other? And then all the aspects of the consequences of what that encounter can lead to not to mention the emotional consequences of just, you know, that coming and going, coming and going for both parties. So um, I think that, you know, it's, it, it, it goes from a pop song to an opera, you know, it's, yeah, you know, yeah. it goes from a uh, pop fiction novel to a, uh, a British uh, uh, Jane Austen novel. <laughs> like, you know, when you look at like Jane Eyre or uh, you got to be creative. Yeah, you got to be patient. Mm-hmm. You got to be patient. I mean, you got to there's a lot of stuff to iron out, you know, you got to give it time, give it trust and give it temperance and sort of become friends first. That's, that's what I, what I, at least what I learned and, you know, understand what the majority of your life together is going to be like when all that spark and flame and passion doesn't wear off. But you know, the, when the honeymoon period is over, are you guys going to be there? as an old couple in that rocking chair, just waxing lyrical about the clouds. Are you going to be able to do that? And is she going to have your back? Are you going to have your hers um, without the sex goggles on? Right, without right? Uh, demanding pleasure from the other person in every regard. That's it. Instead of that person being a plaything. Tell me more about this uh, intimacy ladder. That's fascinating. So yeah, I, I just lo- it was just almost an offhand comment I heard from someone, this spiritual director I have actually, he's a pretty, pretty uh, wise old fella, as they'd say. And he was talking about that. And he said, yeah, I mean, really, it's just that I think it comes back to 
the idea of libido dominandi is a fascinating concept mm -hmm. whereby there's a will to pleasure or a will to peace. Actually, it's the will to power. But that's the interesting dynamic is between power and pleasure. You know, um, Nietzsche talked about this, the will to power, right? That the Greco-Roman sort of ancient modality of society was a will to power. Right. Who, who's the most powerful army? Who's the most clever emperor? And, and who's going to fight off the other ones who want to be you most? And sort of that was manifest in all layers of society. And then the revolution was, the Christian revolution was, okay, we're going to go for more of a will to peace model. Let's all try and just get along and love each other, right? And it took 2,000 years to embed that into the day-to-day -day of society, but I think we kind of reached it to a degree in the Western world <clears throat> that we take for granted now. But societally, and Nietzsche was trying to overthrow that, right? So Nietzsche was like, hey, screw this woo-woo, lovey-dovey stuff. Let's go back to the, the good old days. And we got uh, Nazism out of that and communism. So now I think we're back to will to peace, hopefully, to stay. Uh, but then the, the drama un unfolds in each and every person individually then. Do I want to live a life of will to power or do I want to live a life of will to peace? Will to power is fun. It's pleasurable. It's exciting. Uh, but at some point you burn out. And sex is a big part of that. So Oscar Wilde and said, you know, everything in life is about sex except sex, which is about power. Mm. You know, and, and you see that, that there's this sort of power play that goes on. The movie Shame with Michael Fassbender is a fascinating portrait of someone dealing with this because they were disempowered as a kid. When you're disempowered as a kid through whatever, broken home, whatever it might be, your adulthood is often trying to regain that power. And a great way to get power is to get control of your senses through pleasure. So that's a crazy relationship between pleasure and power, which I definitely went through. And when you throw that in the trash, you're dealing with a kind of a more boring thing mm. in your will to peace. Yeah. However, it's better for everyone in the long run. And so again, it's like watching Pride and Prejudice. Okay, when is Darcy gonna ditch his pride? When is Elizabeth gonna ditch her prejudice? Oh, finally, like 25 years later, and now they're married, you know, and, and but yeah, that's that's actually it's more a, of an organic process. Exactly. And. And uh, patient process. What are some of like some dating ideas or when I say dating, I mean, like when you get together with your uh, your potential partner, this person that you're courting, um, what kind of things do you do to get to know each other a little bit better beyond conversation? What, what, are, what are some like dating ideas that don't necessarily uh, lead to getting into bed? Yeah, I mean, any number of things can tick the box. You know, one thing that I like is charity. And so charity is my day job, but it's also my evenings and weekends. And how do you guys, you know, charity is such a forgotten thing such a forgotten virtue in our society, but it's the bedrock. You know, people ask, how did a group of illiterate fishermen uh, and their, you know, their, uh, their heirs dissolve the most powerful political and mil military empire in history, the Roman Empire within 300 years? The face of that was charity, you know? And so I think if you guys can figure out how to do some charity together, uh, in whatever way, shape or form that might take, volunteering or uh, going to charity events, you know, and sort of finding events to go to that aren't just, you know, uh, sitting forward, watching sports or watching a movie or, you know, but actually going and interacting with people. Yeah. And charity events are great for that because you get to meet like minded people. You have a drink, you have some fun, you have a dance, but you're there also for a, for a greater cause. That's pretty amazing. Uh so you also get to see how the other person behaves in an environment where nurturing is required. It's almost like, you know, if you go to, if you're doing charity, it's like a family situation in a lot of ways. It's like, how does this person treat someone that, for lack of better terms, is beneath them? How, how do they care? How do they nurture? How do they interact? By which paradigm do they proceed from in an environment that requires, uh, giving yeah as opposed to entertainment which is all taking what totally. a really good idea it's a great way to see someone in action i was in calcutta recently india 
last month, volunteering, among other things, at the uh, Mother Teresa's Missionaries of Charity uh, house and the homes. You know, they have a home for the homeless, home for the handicapped, home for kids, all these different homes. And it's amazing. One of the most awesome parts of it is the other volunteers that come from all around the world. And there was a couple there from France. I mean, they were like in their mid-20s. And, you know, she was there with him and they were, they'd been together for like a couple of years. Meanwhile, she was also talking to the nuns about discerning for vocations because she was in this mode of like, I'm not sure if I want to go this path or that. Monk or marriage. Monk or marriage, you know. <laughs> and, but it was just beautiful, him and her there together. And he was really there supporting her. Like this was her spearheading it. But, you know, what a great thing that he went along with her and the interplay between them and them being there together, but for this third party, you know, the, these poorest of the poor there. It's even charitable to one another to be in that circumstance. I, I think I've heard it, the charity described as willing the good of the other as other, where in most dating circumstances, it's more willing the pleasure that I would receive from this person rather than putting them ahead of your your power and pleasure. So charity is uh, the key word. I think it's huge. I think it's a big thing. And I think it's making a comeback. You know, there are a lot of guys that are jaded. Mm. You know, as I say this, I, I can definitely hear some comments. I can hear some guys thinking, well, you know, these women are all out for themselves. And, um, you know, what, I just need to get mine. How do you overcome that, um, that jaded, cynical sense that you know she's out to get me so might as well i get mine first yeah that's so interesting i just heard that word jaded last week from a group a women's group that i guested in at about charity and a lot of people are jaded with charity with charities asking them for money asking them for this asking them for that and i think the answer comes back to okay technology has transactional you know this whole process, dating, charity, so many different processes now feel transactional. How do we make them feel more human? How do we make, you know, if a relationship is like a handshake, how do we ensure that the, the recipient isn't the only one getting the limelight? And I think for guys, they, 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 we're so caught up on ourselves. Right that we forget that there's another hand that we're shaking here. And it's not about what am I getting out of this? It's about what are we getting out of this? And really also what is she getting out of this? And seeing the dating process, the court, courting process as an exercise in charity too. Because love, was it Aristotle who said, you know, there's these four different types of love. There's eros, obviously, which is everyone's favorite type of love, the sensual love, the fun love, the sexy love. But then you've got obviously philia and storge, which is friendly, family, love. But then there's that weird one, which the Greeks didn't quite figure out, which was agape. Aristotle gave a name to it, that selfless, higher love, but they hadn't quite gotten to grips with God. And so that was the genius of the Christian project, which was, I, you guys couldn't figure out, figure out agape, we'll take it from here. And agape is charity. And I think that needs to be, if you guys want to have a sort of a relationship that is whole. Agape needs to be a part of it. And maybe it's forgotten sometimes. Okay, I want this out of the relationship and I feel this way about it. But even if we don't work out, even if this doesn't end up being the long-term thing, for this time we had together, and this is a very Mother Teresa thing, you know, were we fully present with each other in, in whatever way we could be? And... Uh, you know, it's the Bill Gates versus Mother Teresa School of Charity. Steven Pinker, I don't know if you know him, the pop psychologist. Yeah. You know, he, he said, you know, well, I don't know why everyone gives Mother Teresa this sainthood limelight because Bill Gates has done way more for the world than Mother Teresa. He saved hundreds of thousands more lives, millions of lives with his billions that have funded malaria. And I'm not disparaging that. That's awesome. Yeah. But, see, but still, there's something when we look at... Uh, Mother Teresa were like, well, that's the charitable person. Why? Well, it's because of that humanized element that she brought to it. This isn't just going to be a transaction. This isn't just going to be numbers on a spreadsheet that we save. This is going to be one person and a moment of authentic connection and love 
um, and whatever they need from me in this moment, I am there for them for that. And that is, uh, you know, so if you can, and that's agape. And if you can bring that to, if men could get more in touch with their charitable side, which is perhaps something that's almost a little bit like, what is even that? Yeah. Um, and even if you do, there's a lot of risk involved. You know, there's a lot of risk. Statistically, we know that something like 70% of marriages end in divorce. Um, you come from a divorced family. Um, in some states in the U.S., 90% of divorces are initiated by women. Um, what gives you hope in the vision of marriage in a world where marriage seems almost impossible? I think because it works. And I think at the end of the day, I think people will realize at some point that that's just what works, what we took for granted. You know, it took a long time to get us away from polygamy, for example. You know, the idea of one man for one woman and the fact that that could be better for everyone. That was kind of crazy 2,000 years ago, you know? That was, and still in many parts of the world, is not the done thing. So... I think because it's so normal to us, we just think, okay, that's almost a little bit bland and boring. Um, perhaps I came to appreciate how special that is more through not having experienced that myself firsthand. And so leading by example, and this sort of mimetic desire that Rene Girard talked about, you know, Rene Girard, the French Stanford philosopher who came up with the whole theory of mimetic desire. The idea that when we see people who look happy, we want what they want. That's why TV commercials work so well. If we are discerning about finding a really good partner for life and then living that with joy, I think it'll catch on again. Mm -hmm. Where does, so this may seem like it's coming from left field, but like I said, it requires a lot of courage, uh, a lot of faith, um, but mingled in there is suffering, right? D self denial, carrying a cross, um, saying no to your 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 base desires, uh, saying no to your ego. That at least you know many men would experience in terms of, uh, you know, we we get a sense of self from the sexual interaction. Um, where do you place suffering, or how do you? By what paradigm do you uh, see suffering as a, a redemptive thing or as a positive thing, as a means of growth in your interactions uh, dating this way? Yeah, I think suffering is built into what it is to be human, right? From, from the beginning and, or, 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 you know, from the fall. And that is, if you look at sacrifice, human sacrifice on a societal level was the norm of every culture for tens of thousands of years. And then we gradually moved to animal sacrifice and then self-sacrifice. So this idea of sacrificing yourself and the catharsis happening not through some victimized third party, but happening through you, that's pretty new too. And I think, again, it's that will to power versus will to peace thing. How can I bring this into myself? And that's, an, you know, it sucks in the moment, but then actually better for everyone, including myself, in the long run. And I think uh, there's that, you know, I'm, I, I'm seeing that now, you know, as you date, you know, you start having to make sacrifices, you start having to offer things up. Compromise, I guess, is the word people say. Mm -hmm. But again, it comes back to charity. You know, I think that um, charity is a form of offering up. Charity is sort of hand in hand with sacrifice. The idea of, uh, you know, even at the mass, it's the offertory that happens right before the Eucharist. Because they, they historically, John Chrysostom said, you know, there's two things. There's a Eucharist that you take in the church and then you walk out and you find a walking altar of the poorest of the poor. And that's your second Eucharist. That's your second sacrifice, your second offering. You give them money, you give them time and help. And that is how you serve God. And so I think... Um, if we all realize that, you know, it's about embodying your own sort of sacrifice for the things you have to give up when you when you become one. Hmm. So let's backtrack for a moment. Um, you know, you had a, a long, casual uh, dating history. 
and you became very adept at a at a means of meeting women um, by Roger Curry. Oh, Alan Roger Curry. A Alan Roger Curry. May he rest in peace. Uh, yes. Apparently, he passed away recently. Called Mode One, and uh, it's a very upfront way of being with women that is very attractive to them. Uh, there are also many other dating modalities. Guys who are dating coaches, they teach you how to meet women. Uh, a lot of it leads to degeneracy. Where do you see uh, the place for, I don't know, for lack of better terms, pickup techniques or ways of approaching women uh, blended with this virtuous approach to courtship and, and dating? Yeah, so I, you know, I read all those dating guru books and tried a few different courses too. And, you know, I, I think that it was actually one of those dating coaches what was his name? Neil Strauss, the guy who wrote the game, who said, you know, the techniques they teach are not about getting her to like you. It's about getting you to get the guts to even walk over to her in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of guys, these kind of dating guru people, um, I think that they bank on somehow thinking guys can make women be attracted to them who are never going to be attracted to them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just not going to happen. And, and what I really appreciated about Alan Roger Curry was like, it's not about getting someone to like you. It's about just going over and communicating in a human way, like just being upfront and straightforward about what you want, seeing if that overlaps with what she might want, and then continuing the conversation. How revolutionary is that? Yeah. <laughs> and yet we hide behind all these different things, dinners and drinks and dating right things, you know hiding our intention hi and hiding our intentions all the way through marriages sometimes yeah you know, sometimes it makes its way all the way into the marriage where it's like do we really know what each other wants you know mm -hmm. so i think what i really appreciated about alan roger curry who i met in la was that he was radically about just truth and being real and you know he was a, he was a straight up player from the streets of chicago but at the at the end of the day he was just sick and tired of the BS in dating and dating culture. And so when I was in my more promiscuous period, I guess you could say, um, I appreciated that because I, I, even within the realm of this very casual minded approach I had to dating, I didn't feel good about misleading women about right. what I wanted. Like, oh yeah, you know, I want to be your boyfriend or whatever, just to get you into bed. And then I was, that always felt really icky. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I thought that his techniques of, if you want to call it techniques, his just framework of thinking about how to communicate. It's not just helpful in relationships, but in everything, you know, business. So that you see that there's a place for that, even for men who are walking the virtuous path. Yeah, because I think you can, and we came up with this, right? During your right. program where you can adapt it. You can take the uh, means and just change the ends. Mm -hmm. And so I think what we said was, you know, if your ends are a long-term a marriage, um, how do you, that's almost as scary as communicating to someone, hey, right. I'm just here for a good time, not a long time. Walking up and saying, I'm here for a long time and a good time. And that's scary too. Yeah. What's she gonna think? It's, a lot of it comes down to fear of what the other person is gonna think, again. How many uh, self-help gurus basically just base everything on how do you overcome that? Yeah. And so we came up with Mode Mary, right? That's right. I want to dive into that in a moment because I thought that was brilliant. And it's basically how you virtuize, you, you build virtue into a, a degenerate practice, you could say. But before we go there, you, you mentioned the word hiding. And I see a lot of guys hiding behind virtue also. In the same way that you can be hiding behind your, you know, your intentions for sex, um, and, and not being upfront, and you know, kind of going, um, you know, being passive about it. But there are guys who are actually afraid to approach women and to speak to women and to engage with women, but they hide behind a, a pious virtue. You know, that maybe I'm saving myself for marriage, but really, that's not it. Really, it's you're afraid to talk to women. What do you say to guys like that? You know, they may, they, they may be, you would say, convicted right now. Will they hear me say this? Like, yeah, you know, if you're honest with yourself, 
I'm pretending like I'm being a very good Christian boy, but ultimately I'm afraid to get out and speak to women. Yeah. You know, I think fear is uh fear is a big deal and I can relate to that. And I suppose hiding behind virtue what do you yeah, that's not grace perfecting nature. You know, the idea that we have to collaborate with God to get to a better place, grace perfecting nature, we have to step up and have courage too. I think there's and I was in London last summer and the last cat, I, I'm not a tourist attraction guy. I do never really, I'm not a museum goer, sightseer. I lived in New York five years, never saw the Statue of Liberty, never went <laughs> up the Empire State. Lived in London five years, never saw Westminster Abbey. Westminster Abbey is where, you know, the coronations happen. It's where the prince marries the princess. It's probably the most famous church in arguably the world, right? Because it's where... Princess Diana married uh, Princess Charles or whatever. <laughs> and for some reason, I was there for like three days just in London visiting my mom. And I was like, let me, let's go check out Westminster Abbey. Actually, it was because I was reading a book on Benedictine monks, mm. you know, the Benedictines. Yeah. And, and, and the critical role they played in building Europe and the British Isles. Was it the Benedict Option? No, it, it wasn't Benedict Option, but it was, it was something like that. You know, it was more, I was actually the rule of St. Benedict. It was yeah, the original okay. piece. That's the original piece, that. yeah. And I got, I got a little fascinated by these Benedictine monasteries. And lo and behold, I learned that Westminster Abbey was a Benedictine monastery. Abbey, it's kind of in the title. But there aren't many abbeys left in England because of the Reformation where they were destroyed. You know, the, de the des dissolution of the monasteries. But this was one of the last ones standing. Anyway, I was surprised to find that when you walk through the main stretch... At the end, there is this absolutely beautiful wing called the Lady Chapel. And it's kind of got these huge glass, uh, stained glass windows. And it's where Henry VII is buried next to his wife. Henry VII was the last Catholic king of England. Uh, his son, Henry VIII, was, I guess, technically the last Catholic, but the first Protestant king of England. And Henry VII, though, was devout to Our Lady. And when, he was also the last English king to win his throne on the battlefield. And so he, he had been hiding out in France for like 15 years. Richard III was there. He took a boat round to Wales, marched on England, beat Richard III, I don't know where, and was crowned king of England on August 22nd, which is the feast of the crownship of Mary, coronation of Mary in heaven, right? So he dedicated his whole thing to Mary and his mother was a hugely charitable woman. She founded a ton of, I mean, Oxford and Cambridge University were half built by this woman, Lady Margaret Beaufort. But the fascinating thing that I read, because then I went and read his biography, I was interested just because I was taken in by the beauty of this building, is his shield. And his shield has three things on it. It has uh, a lion, a lily, and this bird, gosh, I can't even remember the name of the bird, but the, uh, the bird represents perseverance. So you've got to persevere in things. The lily represents mercy. And that was a huge sort of thing based on Our Lady that he brought into his whole court and how England was run. And there was a lot of progress there. But the, the, you, know, you can never forget the lion, the courage. There's always got to be that courage and I think is if you're trying to be virtuous and be merciful and all these different things, but you don't have the courage to actually bring that into the world by getting up and going out there and facing off with the things that may push back against you sometimes, the mercy is never going to happen. So, so that struck me that you've got to have that courage. And that's what I brought to the group, right? Was like, guys, you know, I, I know that we're all trying to be virtuous, you got to go out there and sort of um, and actually live it. And that might require you to get, you know, living through some fear. That's right. And this inspired you to. So uh, the guys in the program looked up to you and, and rightfully so. You, you know, a lot of them lack that courage. They never really spoke with women. And you uh, were adept in this process of mode one that you had learned from uh, Alan Roger Curry. Um, but you, you raised it up. 
you you brought light to it and you called it Mode Mary. Tell us a little bit about that and um, you know the process by which a man would go about in having that courage, also that mercy and uh, and bringing it into his dating life. Yeah, so I still found that maybe there was a spiritual aspect to dating that was missing for me. And I was looking at the Alan Roger Curry stuff and thinking, okay, that stuff works really well, but what yeah. if your values change from, okay, I wanna you know, have a short-term fling with someone to I wanna have a long-term thing with someone. And so I w was doing this Marian consecration. Have you done one of those? Not yet. No, highly recommend it. I didn't have a clue what it was. I didn't even know what a consecration was. Someone asked me, hey, doing a Marian consecration in our parish, will you narrate the book? Because of your British accent, bloody bloody. <laughs> I was like, I'm about to go on holiday. This was summer. <laughs> um, fine, I'll do it. And I basically did it like on the run. It turned into almost kind of a podcast. But long story short, this is how Mary entered my life because I was very kind of like this about Mary. You know, I think there's so many great things about the Catholic faith. But one of the things that maybe is harder for some people to wrap their heads around is, is Mary. And uh, so Mary just came at me. Yeah, <laughs> you know, As she tends to, right? Yeah. I mean, it's incredible what she does. And so I was very inspired by this experience of like getting to know her. And so then I was like, you know, Jewish moms, Jewish moms are great matchmakers. You know? <laughs> yeah, right. Wouldn't she be the ultimate matchmaker? What if you make Mary your matchmaker? What if you make Mary your wingwoman almost in this dating process? And so it was, again, you sent me, I think a couple of texts over this period about, it was just so providential about, you know, Mary and a couple of things that I folded in. And then I thought, okay, yeah. So what if we base ourselves? And that was really step one, base yourself in virtue. And, you know, the virtue that we're looking for in terms of, going out there. So, so you're based in this virtue. And then the second step was pray and pray to Mary, bring in God to the dating process because, you know, God, the word comes from the proto Indo-European, right? The pre-ancient language that we all spoke of um, to invoke. So to call, right? To call upon, but it also uh, means to pour forth. So there's like this incoming and outgoing aspect to God. You know, like breathing in and breathing out mm -hmm. the spirit. Yeah. And so Yahweh. what does that look like? And I and the amazing thing was St. Maximilian Kolbe talking about the spouse of the Holy Spirit, which is Mary and the Immaculata and sort of um, how do we bring the Holy Spirit into our lives, God? Uh, well, you do it through Mary. Go it's amazing. You know, I always marvel at that, that she's the spouse of the Holy Spirit. She's... We call her the mother of God, but she's also married to God in a way, and her name is Mary. Yeah. I mean, how could you ignore that, especially in terms of looking for a life partner to marry? Right. Yeah, it's it's funny, isn't it? I mean, yeah. it's kind it's of... It's the perfect marriage. <laughs> <laughs> Maria. Mm -hmm. No, it's it's uh, it's freaky. I'll just put it that way. You know, I, I, I was always such a skeptic. I just thought... Uh, I just thought it was a bunch of fairy tales. I think I remember you struggling with Mary and we had yeah. a bunch of conversations. So it's amazing to see how that you've, you've enfolded it with this approach to meeting women. What kind of advice would you give guys who um, maybe want to adopt that approach of, um, of chastity and virtue, uh, but in dating in a courageous way? Man, you know, I mean, I should ask the master, but you, you've been very well married for the last 20 years and I'm still learning. I would say, you know, base pray, hey, that was Mode Mary. Base yourself in what you're looking for. Know what your intentions are. That was Alan Roger Curry's thing. If you don't know what you're looking for, if you don't know what you want, how are you ever going to communicate it? Right. So I think a lot of us jump that step. It's like, okay, what am I looking for? What are my intentions here? Base yourself in those. And right. that's virtue, right? It's not like I'm looking for vibes, vibes will be important, but initially I'm looking for virtue. I'm looking for our values to overlap That's right. someone for life. And then pray, bring in God into it uh, through Mary. So, you know, say Maximilian Colby's, uh, what is it? Um, Let me be a fit instrument in your, in your immaculate hands. That prayer, you know, the, the Maximilian Colby prayer, bring Mary into it. Come Holy Spirit living in Mary, right? Come Holy Spirit living in Mary. Let me be a fit instrument in your immaculate hands. 
and then hey you know like the notebook the meet cute moment where you know he he walks up to her and i think the first thing he says is basically you know ryan gosling to can't remember her name you know do you want to do you want to dance with me i mean most guys would be like what a dumb pickup line what a silly thing to say first but it's something and that's what i said to the guys i said you guys are so caught up in saying the right thing just go up and say hey just literally walk up and say hey and see what the next thing that happens is and that was mode mary you know bass pray hey and i used it and uh bass pray hey bass pray hey mm -hmm. Base, knowing where you're coming from, what you want, pray and say, hey. So you mentioned a Get few- Get Mary into the, into the, actually into the driving seat. You're just a passenger. You, you mentioned a few um, ejaculatory prayers, I guess you could say. Repeat those once again, these short prayers that uh, maybe you would recite before going up and speaking to a woman saying, hey. Goodness me, yeah, what was it? I think, I think the main one, the main one that I said was this one. Come Holy Spirit living in Mary, let me be a fit instrument in your immaculate hands. And that was St. Maximilian Kolbe, who died in Auschwitz, right? He was one of the many priests who died under the Nazis. And he was this sort of warrior for the militia immaculata, the, right. knights, the knights of Mary. And his goal was to educate, re-educate the modern world into the beauty of Mary. And sort of, so I think even just that short prayer, you know, um, and Angelus is another good one. Mm -hmm. You know, um, the angel of the Lord declared unto Mary and she conceived by the Holy Spirit. Hail Mary, and then full the of Hail grace. Mary, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So you know, I, those short prayers, yeah. you can say, you know, just you might be in that Starbucks or wherever. And you're like, wow. Or, you know, after mass is where a lot of guys get scared to talk to someone they may be into. And it's like, well, let me just, you know, face pray, hey. I love it. I love it. So um, do you have a, a prayer rule? Like you pray a certain amount of time, a certain amount of minutes a day, a certain amount of prayers a day? I'm doing Exodus 90 again right now. Mm -hmm. And so that's an hour a day, holy hour. Do you include prayers for your future spouse or for your, you know, your relationships? Yes, I used your one from the course. And now I have a sleeping St. Joseph statue on my bedside with a prayer underneath it. Nice. So St. Joseph is uh, hopefully on it. And obviously, yeah, Mary. Yeah, I fold it in. Maybe not every day, but it's definitely an intention there. And, uh, you know, that's, we're, I'm in uncharted territory. So mm -hmm. there's no way I know what to do next. I am really just, you know, figuring it out hand in hand with, yeah. with, uh, with the Holy Spirit leading the way, yeah. which is a weird place for me to be in. Right. Coming from from a very un un sort of um, guided mo mindset, allowing grace to carry you through. Exactly. How important do you think religion is for this whole process to unfold in its most resourceful way? A lot of guys are listening to this, and they may be rolling their eyes, like, "Oh, these weird religious nuts talking about Mary and Jesus and things like that." Um, how important is it for you and how important do you think it is in general um, in order to walk this path? I can't speak for other people. I think the most important thing to remember is that God is love. You know, God is love. And so whatever that means for you, just because you haven't been baptized in the Catholic faith, I know that more traditional Catholics disagree with this, but what I saw in Calcutta kind of really shifted my mindset because Mother Teresa really stood for the idea that everyone is a beloved child of God. She got that from St. Charles de Foucault. I don't know if you've heard of him. Legend, right? Died having converted zero people, <laughs> having published right? zero pages, you know, in a desert in North Africa hmm. because his whole point was all you need to do is be a presence of love and the rest will take care of itself. Guess what? His writings get discovered in a cave in Morocco. Eventually they make it into a book, which makes it into, a, into Mother Teresa's hands. And that was her thing. Most of the people she served were Hindus, Muslims, you know, atheists. She didn't care. It wasn't about converting people. It wasn't about being a Catholic. She was a Catholic. She was in love with Christ. But it's about 
living that idea of God is love. And so I think, uh, you know, for me personally, it's vital because I, I, I don't know, I, I couldn't imagine it any other, other way. Um, I am a romantic misfit though, you know, is, you know, that's just the way I've come into this. And uh, other people who come out of strong families, you know, maybe that's part of the beauty of this mustard seed. You know, when you have a strong family, you have such a wonderful model that you've come out of to model in your own life and your own family. So that's almost shorthand for you. Of course, it's challenging. Of course, it's going to be tough. But um, perhaps you don't need to lean on religion as much to understand it because it's built into how you see the world in a way, even though you might not be religious at all. But I'm just saying the more like literal aspects of that and how that works. But for me, uh, it's necessary. And for, for guys who are wondering, I would say it's a wonderful place to start. It's a wonderful place to get some ideas if you are at a loss for how to approach a, a long-term relationship. Right. right. And we have teachings from the church. We have uh, tradition. Um, there's a lot of guidance from the church. Um, like I said, I'm diving into theology of the body, which is all about gender and marriage. And yeah, there's so much good stuff there to guide us in a world where we're so lost. We're coming up on an hour now, and uh, I wonder if you'd be willing to maybe share a message of hope to some guys who are listening to this that, you know, maybe they feel dejected or lost and, you know, have lost hope in the fact that they could find a wife and that uh, marriage could work out well and that there are virtuous women out there and that this path is worth taking. Yeah, I think one of the biggest things in the Western world is loneliness. And it's one of the side effects, the big side effects of economic growth, prosperity, technology. I can speak for myself. That was a huge part of living that lifestyle, of thinking I could just be the lone wolf. And, uh, you know, if I needed a bit of sex, I could go on a dating app and get that or porn uh, or just, you know, fester in this sort of incel minded sense. And I would say that that is a very lonely place to be. And so almost like loneliness has been fetishized in some senses. And I think it's, it's necessary to, instead of building ditches, build bridges and get out there and just get into relationship with people. And a wonderful way to do that is charity because that's when you get to realize that there is something much bigger out there. And that's Mother Teresa said, you know, the poorest of the poor are not necessarily in Calcutta in a slum. They might be your next door neighbor in the big house with the fast car who are shut in there with no real connection because everyone just views them as a rich person, as a bank balance. And so here in the West, we are so far ahead. You know, the the level of poverty you see in India is incredible. And yet they are so connected to each other. There's so much relationship that they're, they're, they're in a way much richer than us in terms of their, their connectedness and, and, and sort of um, humanized kind of way of life. And so I would say the first thing is to get into relationship and a wonderful way to do that is charity. And I would suggest, you know, right now in Lent, the season of almsgiving, Arms comes from the Greek eleos, mercy, acts of mercy, acts of love, not necessarily financial. Offer up a few hours of your Saturday, go and help in a, in a soup kitchen or a homeless shelter or wherever you might go and see how you feel after. It's a bit like going for a run. Yeah. You're, gonna, you're, gonna, you're not going to want to do it beforehand. It's kind of going to suck during, but afterwards you're going to be like, I'm glad I went for that run. Yeah, you're putting yourself in the current of love. Exactly. And and the the disco, you know, the disco shh of love, the best kind of love. Yeah. <laughs> this has been amazing, man. Thank you so much. You've inspired me. I know you were part of my program and you learned quite a bit from uh, the things that I've taught. But um, a lot of the guys in the program have learned a lot from you. And I'm happy that you were able to share your experience and to elevate it to such a degree that it takes on this spiritual aspect. Um, you've also inspired me to consider opening up 
my GTG program once again, uh, which includes recordings from your teaching, which was amazing, as well as all the teachings from Benny that have helped you along your way in finding a woman. And of course, the way of traditional marriage and family that I taught, given that you know, I've been married 20 years now, and there's a way that allows marriage to work. So uh, we're doing good things here, man. And, uh, you and you definitely see, are. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy to see the fruits of it. Cheers. Appreciate yeah. it. It's been a it's been a pleasure as always. Awesome. Well, that's it, guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this uh, series, uh, this show, and we'll see you next time. Done. If you're a high achieving businessman, executive, or entrepreneur who's dominating in business but struggle with drinking, drugs, overeating, or any filthy vice, here's some advice. The biggest mistake that you could make is to try to quit cold turkey and use willpower to overcome your cravings. If you've ever quit for a few days or a few weeks only to self-sabotage by binging worse than before, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. Not only has my company helped thousands of men destroy vice and dominate life, I personally confronted and overcome the same struggles when I found myself hooked on weed at the peak of my business career. If you've got four minutes to listen to a coach who will help you achieve total self-mastery and control over your inner punk, then listen up. If you don't beat drinking, drugs, or any life-draining dependency, in 90 days or less, not only will my company give you your money back, we'll pay for your first month's stay at a rehab retreat of your choice. That's what you need to succeed. So let's go, bro. Just visit waronvice.com, fill out an application, and my team will get back to you with the details. Hope to see you on the inside. Done.